peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. Amen. Can you say to the person beside you, you are so loved by God. We just give honor to God because we know that God has been good to us in many different ways. Amen. And sometimes it's good in ways we don't expect. Remember, God's goodness is never shown according to your terms. God's goodness will always be revealed in His terms because God knows what is better for us. Amen? Sometimes you think this is what I need, but God knows you need something better than that. Amen? And so God expresses His goodness in different ways. <laughs> We've been going through the book of Galatians, right? I've been talking about what it means to walk by the Spirit. And we saw that walking by the Spirit, first of all, means walking in love. That means you live a life of intentionally loving people around you. Okay? God did not save us from our sins so you can go back and live a selfish life again. No. God saved you from your sin so that now, as you're set free from the power of sin in your life, you can now choose deliberately and intentionally to live a life of loving people around you. Okay? That's why the fruit of the Spirit, as you walk by the Spirit, the Spirit of God produces the fruit of the Spirit, which is what? Love. That's love and all the other characteristics mentioned there, the other eight characteristics, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, all of these are just characteristics of Christian love or love that reflects the love of God. You understand that, okay? So, and because we are a community that believes in loving people, we want God to use us to bring healing to the broken and damaged lives of people around us, okay? And so just before I give the message, every week, month, we're going to recite what we are as a community for, okay? Why we are called Beraka Community International, because we want to be a community of blessing and healing to people. So I'm going to allow you now to read with me what we stand for as a community, okay? So Beraka Community International, we are a what? A healing community, restoring damaged identities, empowering families, modeling and cascading a biblical culture of blessing across the nations. What's a culture of blessing? It's a culture of affirmation. We live in such a negative culture where everybody is critical, condemning, judgmental everywhere. Right? That's why most people are broken and damaged in our society, beginning in the family. We'll talk more about that in the message in a little while. That's why our desire is to be a healing community for those people, for all people, because all people have experienced a lot of damage in their own families. Okay? We want God to heal, bring healing and restoration and find their identity in Christ. Okay? This is what we stand for. Next slide. Can we read this now together? We are a church without walls. Okay? A community... That has no code of exclusivity. That means we don't believe that if you're here, you cannot join other churches. Of course, you, you can worship with other churches. You can serve others. But this is your family. You come back and report to us what you did. Okay? We are not exclusivist. Anyone can come here. Anyone from any group, from any religion can come here and be blessed. Okay? Next. We also be welcome to everyone regardless of capacity, color, or culture. The love of Christ transcends all uh, barriers, racial, uh, cultural, or even in economic barriers. Christ's love is for all. You see, religion divides. The love of Christ unites. Amen. Amen? Can we say that together? Religion divides. religion divides. The love of Christ unites. Love of Christ. But remember that it's love in truth. It is love in truth. Okay, next. We focus on building the one kingdom of Christ and the larger body of Christ rather than just our own community. Amen? We're not concerned about, you know, beraka, beraka. No. We believe we're just part of a bigger body of Christ. And if there's any need in any other church that we can help, we will extend our help to them. The Lord raised up this community to be a blessing to the other churches. The Lord raised up this community to be a model church that will model unity in the body of Christ. We have committed ourselves as the Lord blesses us financially that we are committed to help poorer churches financially. We will have pastors who are struggling financially in their churches because they're coming from poor churches. We will at the right time, once they pass our care, to pro help provide financial support for them. We want this church to be a channel of blessing to the whole body of Christ as well as to the lost. Amen? We want to show the churches that this church is not going to be a private kingdom of Christ. This church is part of a bigger kingdom. We want to be actively involved in helping other bodies of uh, churches around us to become more effective for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? 
That's why we don't exist for ourselves, we exist for everyone. Next. Our people come to be empowered to serve at others and other communities, not just our own, out of their love for Christ. Somebody tells me, Pastor, I think the Lord is leading me to help the church because they're having a problem, they need some training, can, can I go train them? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Whatever we can do to help them. Okay, next. Out of their love for Christ, you can serve. Our people serve Christ according to their callings, capabilities, and convictions, not by imposition. I'm not here saying, okay, I want you to do this, whether you like it or not. No, no, no. I'm going to ask you, what are your gifts? What gifts have God given you? What do you believe is your calling? Okay, I'll help you fulfill your calling. That's my job. Okay, so don't wait for me to tell you, do this, do this, and do that. Because I cannot be the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You listen to what the Spirit of God is saying in you. Know what God is giving you. Come to me, Pastor. The Lord has given this gift. I really want to exercise it. I want to serve the Lord in this way. Okay, then I'll provide an opportunity for you to use that gift. It is the Holy Spirit who assigns the gifts. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who appoints us into our callings. Our, the pastor's job is simply to recognize your calling and help you fulfill it. You understand that? Okay, that's what we are. Next. We seek to give and lend support to those in need, whether individuals or other communities of faith. We are not limited to our own church. Next. We prefer to network and partner with other communities who share similar values, visions, and goals, goals as we do, rather than just do it on our own. We will not try to duplicate what others are doing. If you believe that something that somebody is doing is helping us fulfill job, we can partner with them. We don't have to be redundant. We have to pull our resources so we maximize resources God has given the body. Next. We seek to bless and encourage all other communities of faith and affirm them in their labor of love for one Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of denomination, we affirm our brothers and sisters across denominations. Amen? There is no denominationalism among us, right? Next. We believe that unity in the body is not uniformity, but unity is showing respect, love, and support in the midst of diversity. We can have different emphasis, but we are one. We are one in that we're going to show respect and love to one another as members of the body of Christ. Amen? There is no discrimination, no judgmentalism, no condemnation, no rejection here. If there are brothers and sisters in Christ who have the same faith as we have in Jesus Christ, we will respect and love them, even though there are other things that are different. Okay? And then, we also, we affirm together with other communities of faith, one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of us all. Okay? We are a community that seeks to bring healing to others. You know why? We've been going through the book of Galatians. We have seen that in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 up to verse 15. Okay. We find this, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. So, that, so these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now listen to this carefully. Paul's epistle to the Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul out of tremendous concern for what's happening in the church. The churches of Galatia was being infiltrated but why are called, but what are, by what are called Judaizers. Can you say Judaizers? Yes. Judaizers are Jews, full-blooded Jews, who believe in Judaism as the only valid religion on earth. Okay? And their desire is to convert Gentiles into the Judaistic religion. So they are called Jewish missionaries. Jewish missionaries who go out to, out to the Gentile cities to convert Gentiles into the Jewish religion. You understand that? Now, Paul had been preaching to the Galatian churches and he taught them the salvation. You can be saved, not because of the law, but because of the grace of Jesus Christ. But these Jewish missionaries will follow Paul wherever he goes and they will contradict his teaching by teaching them, no, you have to be a Jew before you can be saved. Trusting in Jesus is not enough. You've got to obey the whole law. You've got to follow the law of Moses or else you cannot be saved. And so wherever they go, they throw people into confusion. Right? So what happens when, you know, you receive one teaching and then another comes and tells you another teaching? Okay? And so these people got confused. Now listen to this. What were these Judaizers preaching? They were saying, trusting in Jesus alone is not enough to save you. 
you have to be circumcised. And circumcision to the Jew is entering into commitment to obey the law of Moses as a means of salvation. In other words, you've got to obey all the commands of God before God can accept you. Before you can be saved, you've got to obey all the commands of God given to Moses. Do you understand that? When Paul heard about this, he was so, <laughs> so troubled that he wrote what is considered to be the most fiery, fiery epistle in the New Testament. If you read Galatians, you know, in most epistles of Paul, he would give a commendation. I, I praise God because I heard of your love in Christ and your hope and your faith. I mean, in every letter, you'll find Paul commending the church for something before he goes to his message. Galatians is the only church where he has no commendation at all. From the very start, he said, you know, I am so surprised that you are easily moved away from the gospel that you have received from me. And he said, if any man or any angel from heaven preaches a gospel to you that is different from what I preach to you, let him be accursed. I mean, right there at the beginning, he was, you know, really fiery. And then you go to chapter 3, who bewitched you? <laughs> I mean, you never Paul, hear Paul, you know, speaking that language in any epistle. He was really so upset and troubled. You know why? Because these Galatian Christians were facing we're facing, we're facing the possibility that they will be severed from Christ if they go back to the law as a means of salvation. Christ would be useless to them because they believe they can be saved because of their obedience to the law. Do you understand this? We have been preaching this since last week, but listen to this. Many today of you who have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior sometimes still live in a way and relate yourself to God in such a way that you feel that if you have not been good enough today, God rejects you. How many of you feel that? You know you committed a lot of sins and then you feel you just are not worthy to come to God and you know God has rejected you, God doesn't, doesn't like you, and God hates you. How many of you feel that way? Can you raise your hands? Come on, let's be honest. Okay, thank you for being honest. I want you to listen hard today because in the last Sundays we've been preaching about this, I will go into more detail and I want you to know once you understand the truth, the truth will set you free and you will be free. Amen. Now listen to this very carefully. The Apostle Paul in the Epistle to the Galatians has been reiterating again and again. You are never accepted by God because of your works of obedience. Never. Because our works will never be enough to make us acceptable because we still sin. God expects sinless holiness. Be holy as I am holy. God's holiness is sinless holiness. And he cries, be holy as I am holy. That is humanly impossible. You understand that? To gain acceptance before God, you have to obey every law God gave to Moses. James 2 says, if you keep the whole law and break one point, you are guilty of breaking the whole law. You understand that? You see, that's why Paul said, obeying the law can never make you acceptable to God because your obedience will never be enough because God expects perfection because he is sinlessly holy. That was God's standard. You understand this? No amount of good works you can do can ever make you acceptable to God. And because that was our situation, God, because of His great love for us, because His justice condemns us, because of our sins, His holiness rejects us because we are sinners. In God's desire to reconcile us back to Him, in His desire for us to come back to Him without compromising his justice without compromising his holiness because God will always be holy he cannot stop being holy just to uh, you know get you back to him he cannot stop being just just to get you back to him sin has a penalty and the Bible says sin's wages is death and because God is holy and we're sinners he can never accept us the holiness of God rejects us because of our sinfulness do you understand this you see, but God is loved us. And he had to do something about 
you know, His holiness and just, He cannot compromise those two uh, attributes of God, you know, for the sake of just getting us back. He cannot do that. Or He will deny Himself. Do you understand this? Even in the world, you cannot sacrifice justice just because you want to show kindness to a relative who has been, you know, accused of murdering a family. And because you're the judge, and the one brought before your court is your son, and he is be found guilty of murdering a whole family, you cannot show mercy and say he will not be condemned. Who will give justice to the family that was massacred? Love cannot violate justice. Mercy cannot violate justice. You understand that? Love cannot violate God's holiness. God will remain holy. And He will expect holiness. You understand that? That's why all of us, knowing that God is holy and just, we live in fear and guilt whenever we sin, right? And we feel rejected because we feel that my worth is being measured by my performance. My value, my acceptability is being measured according to my performance. That's the law. Say that with me, law. You see, legalism, which means that everything is measured by the law, legalism means that your worth and your acceptability is always measured by your performance. Say that with me. Your worth and acceptability is always measured by your performance. If you don't obey God, goodbye. If you sin, you're dead. You understand that? That's law. Paul said, we have been set free from the law. Now I want you to understand what Paul is saying. He's not saying that God's laws have been invalidated. No, God remains righteous and He will expect us to live a righteous life. You understand that? But the law as a means of salvation has been superseded by a new relationship established by Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus Christ came and died on that cross, He opened a way for us to be accepted by His Father no longer on the basis of your performance because that would make it impossible for you to be accepted. Jesus' death was given so that He will take the death penalty that you and I deserve for our sins. He takes your death penalty and suffers it on your behalf. Jesus saw you worth dying for and giving His life for you. Do you understand that? So that He can forever remove from you the penalty of death you deserve because of your sins. He has forever removed that from you because He took your place and died your death on your behalf. Do you understand this? And thereby, when you put your faith in Christ, that is why in John 6, 39, he says, This is my Father's will, that those whom he has given me, that I will lose not even one of them, but raise them up on the last day. The commitment of Jesus, when you trust in him, I will never lose you. Never. Because every time you sin, I will cover you and intercede for you because my death paid for all your sins. And because of that, my Father will always forgive you. He will be just enough to forgive you because justice cannot require punishment for sin that has already been punished for. Jesus bore the punishment that we deserve so that we don't have to be punished anymore. Are you listening to this? And that punishment is death, eternal separation from God. Jesus died on that cross to forever remove that penalty from our lives. Do you understand this? Are you listening? Okay? And because of Jesus Christ's righteous life, you see, he obeyed the law to the letter. He, he was the one who obeyed every, every command of the law. He did this not on his behalf. Jesus Christ, even before he became human, was completely obedient to the Father, perfect in obedience. But why did he have to submit himself to the law of Moses to obey it completely? He was not doing that for himself, he was doing that for us. You see, Jesus Christ had to become flesh, to be human, to represent us as the new man before his Father. 
Adam was the old man, the old humanity from which all of us came from. Because of Adam's sin, all of us have been condemned to die. Now, Jesus comes to be the new man, the new creation. He's not, he's not created, but he represents a new work of God. He will be the head of a new human race that has been acquitted from death. And the only way he can do that is to give his life for you so you don't have to suffer that death penalty anymore. Do you understand this? And he lived a righteous life on your behalf so that when you are united with him in trust, in faith, God sees you no longer on the basis of your righteousness, but he sees you on the basis of the righteousness of Christ. And because you have trusted in Christ, Jesus covers you. God accepts you because of the righteousness of Christ, never by your righteousness. Amen. You understand that? He made sure that the Father will always accept you when you come to him. He is the one who ensures that because he will always cover you because you trusted in him. They understand this. Jesus Christ opened the way so that we can be accepted by the Father anytime, in spite of our sins, because every time you come to God in the name of Jesus, Jesus always covers Father, forgive him. Of course, Sanya is forgiven. I will not be unjust not to forgive. If I did not, I will not forgive him, I will become traitor to you, my son, because you paid for that sin already. And my justice demands that if the sin has been paid for, that I will acquit them, the one who trusts in you. Do you understand this? Are you still here? Yes. Legalism, and that is the problem of Paul with his Judaizers, they're putting these Christians in Galatia under a spirit of legalism again. That they're measuring their worth and acceptability by their performance of them. Paul said, you just have been severed from grace. You've fallen away from grace. We are saved by grace alone. Amen. Apart from the works of the law, Paul said. It's not your obedience to Christ that makes you more acceptable to God than what Jesus did for you on the cross. He said, it is finished. His one death for you, his righteous life, is yours forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, Jesus Christ has become my righteousness, my holiness that makes me acceptable to God. You understand this? Now, why is this so important? Because many of us are living under the spirit of the law or the spirit of legalism. Every time you don't have the courage to come to God after you sin, you know you're living under the law because you're thinking that God is measuring your worth according to your performance. No matter what obedience you do for Christ as a Christian, it will never, it can never, it can never, it can never, it can never add to your acceptability to God that Jesus already accomplished for you on the cross. If you think you will gain access before God because you're goody, 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 you just said that Jesus Christ died for nothing. I don't need him. I don't need him because I can make myself acceptable to the Father because I can be good. You understand that? But we can never be accepted by the Father because we are never sinless. Jesus became sinless before the law on your behalf so that when you trust in Jesus and he, you are united with him, Whenever God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And that makes you acceptable. Because the blood of Christ cleanses you from every sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Do you understand this? Which means that every time you fall into sin, don't picture, ah, you did it again. You know, like, God's not like that. The picture of God when you sin, Christ already showed us what God looks when we sin. He showed that to us through the parable of the prodigal son. That is how the father reacts to sin. He is sorrowful that his son was going to defy him, take the inheritance even if he's still alive. I mean, that was a dishonor and insult to his own father, what the prodigal son did. And this prodigal son wasted his father's years of blood, sweat, and tears, as we would say, of hard work. This prodigal son wasted that in a life of loose living with prostitutes. And when he lost everything, he got hungry. No more money, no more honey. <laughs> And he went back to his friends. They don't want him anymore. 
You see, they're only friends when you have money. You have no money, you have no more friends. <laughs> and he realized. He was so broken. And he said, even the servants in my father's house have a lot to eat. Well, I am the son. I have nothing to eat. It's my fault. And finally, he made, went into remorse that I will go back to my father and I'll ask his forgiveness and I will ask him to treat me as one of his slaves because I don't deserve to be called his son anymore. You hear that? Remorse leading to repentance. And while he was still afar off, do you hear this? While he was still afar off, the Bible said, Jesus said, the father saw him. Now, how can a father who's busy in his estate be able to see his son from a very far distance one morning? How could that happen? He had a big estate. He had so many servants. He could have appointed servants, watch for my son. No, he was the one watching for his son every day. Because he knows, he knows, he knows that sin will always have its consequence. He knows as a father that when you live in sin, you will suffer consequences and that will make you realize how wrong you are. And the father knows his son will face the consequences. And he knows that his son has nowhere else to go but back to his father. And he knows that. And he will stand there waiting every day, looking at the horizon, seeing if his son is coming back. He was anticipating that. From the very beginning that he let his son go, rebel against him and dishonor him as his father, he allowed him to dishonor him. Yet in his love, a heart of compassion, he knew that his son will learn his lesson the hard way. And he knows his son will come back. And that's what the father, he waited. Every day he would look. The son is coming back. And one morning, one morning, there was just a speck of dust in the horizon, walking very slowly. And as he looked, that's how my son walks. That's my son. <laughs> and you know the, what Jesus said? That son dishonored his father threw into a useless life all his father's hard earnings for years. And now he has the guts to come back just to eat. And he saw his son from a distance. You know what the Bible said, what Jesus said? The father ran to him. Ran. Ran. Ran to him. And the son had a memorized confession. He never finished the confession. This is what he wanted to say. Father, I've sinned against heaven. That's a euphemism for God. I've sinned against heaven or God and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants. That's the whole confession, okay? But when he comes back and he sees his father running to him, and then when the father got him, he embraced him in tears. My son is alive. My son is home. He was trying, you know, he was almost suffocated by his father's embrace. He was saying, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And his father said, Servants, bring him this robe. Bring him the sandals. Give him a ring. You're still my son. <laughs> and listen to this. He did not pray the last, he did not say the last part. What was the last part? Treat me as one of your servants. He was never able to say that anymore. You know why? When he heard his father said, give him sandals, slaves don't, are barefooted. He was barefooted at the time. Only slaves are barefooted. Members of the family have sandals. Slaves have very simple clothes. The children of the owner of the estate are always clothed in robes. Slaves don't have rings that are symbols of inheritance because they have nothing to inherit. Sons have rings as a symbol of inheritance. The father said, give him a ring, give him sandals for his feet, give him a robe. The son was not even confessing yet when his father ran to him and embraced him. 
That is how your father feels for you every time you sin. Because he does not accept you on the basis of your performance. If he did, he would have rejected his son. It was the elder brother who represented the pharisaical, legalistic attitude. Remember when Jesus told that parable in Luke 15? There were Pharisees listening to him. So they knew, they knew that when you talk about the elder son, they knew Jesus was referring to them. That's why they got offended by the parable of the prodigal son. And, the, and Jesus said, but the elder son was so angry when he saw his father kill the calf for him and give him a feast. He said, no. The servant said, your father is calling you, come join. Your brothers come back and he's celebrating. No, I don't want to go. How dare my son gets the, the special treatment when he was the one who dishonored my father and I've been here serving my father, honoring my father all these years. I don't even get a party. No, I will not go in. And so the father, after hearing the servant, Master, he doesn't want to come in. The father himself goes out, talks to his son, Son, please come and join me. Father, look, look, Father. I have served you all these years and have never dishonored you. And this son of yours, he is now disowning his own brother. He doesn't call him my brother. This son of yours, he was taken his inheritance and wasted it with prostitutes, comes back, and then you throw him a party? That's the spirit of legalism. Legalism always measures the worth of people based on their performance. My performance, Father, makes me deserve a party, not him. That's legalism. You understand this? That's legalism. But the Father said, Son, all that I have in this estate is yours. You're my firstborn. The firstborn always gets a double portion of the inheritance. You own everything in my estate. Your son has nothing. And he has come back. He was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. Why can't you rejoice with me? You know, like people cannot rejoice over people who sin and then are given favor by God. It's because their pride of their performance makes them believe, I deserve more. When in the eyes of God, nobody deserves anything. Because even if you do good, you still sin, and that's enough to bring you to the death penalty. It takes only one sin in your life for God to condemn you to death. Adam only sinned once, and he was condemned to death. Because God's standard is perfect. That's why our righteousness can never be enough to make us acceptable before a holy God. Never. That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, I want to be found not having a righteousness of my own, which is for, for the works of the law, but having my righteousness from God through Jesus Christ. The righteousness I need to be accepted before God, Paul said, is not a righteousness of my own, of my own efforts by obeying the law, but a righteousness that comes from God as a gift through Jesus Christ, my Savior. That's the righteousness that makes me acceptable to my Father. Amen. Not my righteousness, but His righteousness makes me acceptable to God forever. Are you listening? Now, why is this so important? Now, listen very carefully. Many of you here, many of us here come from dysfunctional families, broken homes, homes where there's always never-ending fightings. Now, listen to this. All of us, almost all of us, grew up in homes where the spirit of legalism ruled the family. The spirit of legalism rules in many homes today. You know what that means? Parents tend to have an unrealistic expectation on their children that being good means being perfect. That means you're not allowed to make mistakes, you're not allowed to, to misbehave, you're not allowed to do anything wrong. Because if you do, you know, you're done. You're not allowed to commit mistakes. A child accidentally trips and the beautiful vase worth 1,500 pesos 
falls and breaks. What does the mother do? <laughs> Turns into what? <laughs> Doesn't the mother understand that little children tend to be very active? And is it the responsibility of the children to act like an adult and control their energies all the time so that they don't break anything? I'm an adult. I should not break anything. I should not even move. They're children. They have no control yet. They have not developed a high level of self-control. It is the responsibility of parents to keep breakable things away from the children because you're the adult who is mature enough to understand that children cannot even control themselves. And so when a vase is broken, ah, you broke the vase! He's saying, my child, your worth is nothing compared to that vase. You broke a vase, what does that, and he's what you get. You're telling your child, child, you're worthless. This vase is worth more than you. That's why I'm going to get back at you for breaking my 1,500 vase. A child's toy was broken. Comes to daddy, my toy is broken. What did you do? The child is broken hearted. Let's say he, he had a part in breaking the toy, but he's a child. What do you expect from a child? Adult behavior. And if a child cannot come to you with his broken toy, when he grows up, he will never come to you in his broken life. He will turn to others. Dysfunctional families are families where law is more important than the person. Where expectations are more important than the worth of a human being. Where a person is downgraded, condemned, and sometimes abused physically simply because he was human. He was just being human. And to make a mistake is human. Nobody is perfect. Not even the abusive father is perfect. In fact, in being abusive, is completely way out from being perfect. We grow up in families where law prevailed. That's why we have been doing, whenever we do something wrong, you're good for nothing. All kinds of labels and curses are held against you just because you failed to perform according to expectations. And when you fail to perform according to expectations, you're worthless. You're good for nothing. That's the spirit of legalism. It is destructive. It is damaging. Do you understand this? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to verse 22. I'm, you already know this. I want you to be reminded of this. Jesus said, before it was said, do not murder. For he who murders shall be liable to the court. Thank God there is a court for murderers. Amen? Nobody saying amen? amen? You want the murderer of your son not to go to court? Thank God there's court. Amen? Attorney. <laughs> he who murders shall be liable to the court. But, but I say to you, if you're angry with your brother, and that is vindictive anger, anger that seeks to hurt, if you are angry with your brother, you will be liable to the court. You hear that? Judgment in the NIV. What is this? ESV, NIV, ESV, okay? And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Okay? There's something lacking there in the original. Whoever says to his brother, get me the NIV. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, you know what's Raka? It means you good for nothing. Raka. 
is an Aramaic word as the language of Jesus, which means you're good for nothing. He says, whoever says to anyone, you're good for nothing, he will be liable to the Supreme Court. Jesus is saying that when you have vindictive anger in your heart against anyone, including your children, including your spouse, or any person, once you have vindictive anger, Jesus is saying, you are no different from a murderer who will face charges in court. When you say to your brother, you good for nothing, and some parents say that to their children, Jesus said, the seriousness of your murder is enough to bring you to the highest court, the Supreme Court. So the Sanhedrin is the highest court in Israel. It's a religious court. And whoever says to his brother, you fool, was that Buang, shall be in danger of the fire of hell itself. Because these are curses. 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 Jesus said, when you curse someone out of anger, in the eyes of a holy God, you just murdered that person. And you are no different from an actual physical murderer in the seriousness of your crime, in the eyes of a holy God. You understand this? Vindictive anger makes us murderers. You know why? Because when you curse your child, you just damage his identity and you're going to damage his destiny. You just murdered him. I have to tell this story, okay? I tend to repeat important stories. Remember the story of the two altar boys? This is a true story, by the way. One was born in Eastern Europe in 18, uh, 1860s. And the other was born in Illinois, USA, three years later, and both of them grew up to be altar boys. Okay? Both of them committed an accident while serving wine to the priest. They both tripped and fell, and the wine fell on the carpet. The boy in Eastern Europe was serving the Greek Orthodox priest, the wine, tripped and fell, and the wine spilled. And the priest was so furious, and he cursed him, you know, in their Yugoslavian language, you clumsy oaf! I mean, you're nothing like a piece of bread and you're so clumsy. You have no worth. It's like saying, you're good for nothing. Get out of my altar. I don't want to see your face again. He was cursed. That boy left the altar in tears, running away from the church. And he never returned to the church all his life. He grew up to become Yugoslavia's worst communist dictator, an atheist. His name was Josip Broz Tito. One cursing word affected his entire future. The other boy in Chicago, Illinois, was serving the priest. He tripped and fell. But the priest, who was a cardinal at the time, bent down with the boy, put his arms around the boy and said, It's okay, son. Nobody's perfect. I know you're going to grow up to become a fine priest one day for God. The priest blessed him in spite of the mistake. And he helped him clean the floor and said, come, go and take another cup of wine. But he say, nobody's perfect. It's okay. I know you did not mean it. I know you did not mean it. You'll become a great priest one day. That boy never left the church and he grew up to become the most beloved Bishop Fulton Sheen. And I was a Catholic seminarian. I read a lot of books of Fulton Sheen. And he has a brilliant mind and a great love for people. What shaped his life was a blessing of a priest that said, you will grow up to become a fine priest for God one day. In spite of his mistake and failure, he was blessed. And that inspired him to become the great person that this father figure spoke to him about. That's why Jesus said, once you curse somebody, you just murder them. Are you listening, church? Are you listening? God doesn't treat us that way. We deserve to be cursed, but Jesus got the curse on our behalf. Jesus became the curse for us so that we can be set free from the curse and enjoy our relationship with the Father because the righteousness of Christ always covers us and makes us acceptable to God all the time. Even if you're sin, you come to God, the Father will welcome you. Son, do you acknowledge your sin? Yes, I'm sorry, Father, you're forgiven. 
Because every time you sin, when you trust in Jesus, Jesus intercedes for you. Remember that? Hebrews 7, 25. I'm reviewing. Hebrews 7, 25. He is able to save completely and forever those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. That's why he can save you forever. Because he's forever interceding for you every time you sin. That's why the time, by the time you ask forgiveness, forgiveness is waiting for you from the Father. Because Jesus already interceded for you. Because you trusted in Jesus. Are you listening? Amen. Brothers and sisters, that's why it's so hard for us today to believe that when we come to God, even when we have fallen to sin, that the Father will not reject us. You know why? Because we have felt that rejection almost for many years in our family and wherever we came from. We felt rejected because we were never affirmed. We were never felt we belong because we we're always measured according to our performance. And we never, never, never measure enough all the time. We're never good enough. We're never good enough for our parents. That's why we feel so rejected as a human being. We feel so damaged. We feel that my worth is gone just because I'm not perfect. I want you to know that we have accepted Jesus as your Savior. Everything changes. When Jesus comes into your life, He covers you. Every time you sin, He will ensure forgiveness will always be there for you. That's why He said, I will never lose you. I will raise you up on the last day. That is my Father's will. Now, I will not lose even one, but raise you up on the last day. I will be your defender. I will be your attorney at law. I will be your advocate. I'll be your spokesman. I will be your intercessor. I will be your mediator. Just trust me. I have given everything to you. And I cried out on that cross, it is finished. It is finished. There is nothing you can ever add to what Jesus did to make you more acceptable to God. His work alone made you acceptable forever because you trusted in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Every time you sin, you cause your father sadness and sorrow, but he can never reject you. Can never. Because Jesus is always there for you, covering you. Are you listening? God doesn't want you to live in guilt. Paul said we are called to live a life of peace, not a life of guilt and shame that has been removed by Christ from our lives. Forgive your parents if they had been very legalistic about you and you did not feel your worth as a son or as a daughter because to them, their law, their expectations is more important to them than your worth as a human being. But the way they treated you and abused you and cursed you, God was very sad about what your parents did to you. He never wanted his fatherhood to be expressed in such a way. Human fathers are not the owners of their children's lives. You don't own the life of your children. You have been given a sacred trust from the God who gave life to those children. Those children belong to your heavenly father alone. You don't own them. You cannot do with them whatever you wish because you don't have the right to do that because God himself said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Colossians 3, Paul says, do not embitter your children so that they will not be discouraged. God is speaking to the apostle Paul, human fathers, I don't want you to do anything that will discourage those children. They don't belong to you. They're mine. You don't do to them whatever you want. Don't you dare embitter your children and discourage them. I am the Lord your God. Are you listening? Your children are precious, precious treasures from God. Entrusted to you so you can show them the love of the Heavenly Father. You understand? Show the love of your Heavenly Father to them. Yes, there is discipline, but discipline administered without vindictive anger. Vindictiveness and discipline are different things. Being vindictive means you hurt your child because you got hurt and you want to get back. That's not discipline, that's vindictiveness. And when you grow up in a spirit of vindictiveness, because you were made to feel that expectations are more important than your worth as a human being, you grow up and you find yourself doing the same thing to your children. 
True or false? If you grow up in a family where you felt rejected because your parents upheld law above your worth, you have no worth at all, when you grow up and get married, you will tend to do the same to your children. And the damage continues from generation to generation to generation. The spirit of the letter, Paul says, kills. The spirit of the letter kills. Legalism kills. But grace and love and godly discipline brings life. Are you listening? You need to forgive your parents. If you want to be set free, you need to forgive your parents. That's your first step. And recognize that many parents don't know any better because they grow up in the same environment. Are you listening? We wish we had courses in parenting in college, high school. We don't have that. Even in seminary. We started one at KTS. I'm now teaching family life to all students. And it is a required subject to graduate. You have to learn how to love your family. You have to learn how to parent your children well and bring them up in a positive environment of godly discipline and affirmation. Because you don't want to damage their identities and cripple their destinies in the process. Remember, there is still discipline. Our children will have to face consequences, but we don't have to administer it in anger or in an abusive manner. You just say, son, what did you do? I broke your instructions. Okay, what's the consequence? I'm grounded. So be it. You're grounded, but I love you. And you have to be firm with the discipline. You have to be firm. But you can do it without shouting, without getting angry, because you know exactly what to do. Say, son, you're grounded. Well, please give it a no. You're grounded. We already talked about this. You're grounded. I love you. You understand that? That's your administered discipline. And you have to administer it consistently so your child knows you're really serious. No, walang palusot. Pag nagpalusot kayo, gusot ang ugali ng anak nyo. Once you, you, you have a consequence prepared for any offense, any misbehavior of your children, implement the consequence. You don't have to shout to get angry. Just say, okay, son. Your allowance is cut off by 50% this week. No negotiations. That least, no. We talk about this, okay? Done. I love you. And because your son knows you're very serious, he'll take you seriously next time. But no abuse, no damage to identity, no cursing, no vindictive attitudes. Those are not necessary. Are you listening? Just apply consequences with love and gentleness, but firm. You understand that? I exercise discipline, even in the church. I can be very firm with church members who I know are living in sin. But I can be very loving also. But they know I'm in business. But they know they can always come to me when they need help. But they know I will never allow them to violate what I've imposed as discipline. You understand that? That's how God deals with us today. Amen? Are you listening? God's love for you is such that He will never measure anymore against the law. You have been freed from that. You're now living under the law. You're living under grace. And grace means completely undeserved favor from God. You don't have to work for it to deserve it because somebody already deserved it for you. Amen. Somebody did work to make you deserving and that's Jesus Christ. His Amen. blood made you worthy to be an heir of everything that belongs to your Heavenly Father. <laughs> Nothing you can ever do can make you any more acceptable. Jesus made you acceptable forever by His blood. And don't take the glory from Jesus. Give Jesus the glory. And remember that you're accepted by the Father because of His blood and His life for you. No other reason. And when you do that, you give honor to Jesus. You don't nullify what Jesus did. I suppose that I will not nullify the grace of God. Because if a man can be accepted by God by my works, then Christ died needlessly. I will not dishonor my Lord. 
I will live by His blood. I will see my relationship with my Father by His blood, not by my performance. And I know my Father will always accept me. He's only waiting for me all the time. He's just waiting for you. Every time you sin, He's just waiting for you. Come home. I can forgive you up to 77 times. Come home. You are more important to me, my son, than my law. That's why I had to give Jesus Christ to fulfill the law on your behalf. Because you are more important to me than my law. Jesus had to do it for you. So I can accept you forever. Hallelujah. Amen. 